Hi guys, Olive here, here today to bring you the next installment in my ongoing series of videos all about the 90s PBS Kids TV show, Wishbone. In case you've never caught an episode of the show before, it was a half hour program directed at kids, and each episode was split into two different storylines. The first storyline was always an adaptation of a work within the literary canon. Now that was most often a book, but they also adapted things like short stories, plays, epic poems, myths legends, folk tales, anything of that nature. And then in the second storyline, we followed a 1990s family living in Texas with their pet Jack Russell Terrier Wishbone, of course. And whatever was going on with them in their storyline always related back to the themes found within the literary adaptation. In this series of videos I do here on my channel, I look at one episode of Wishbone per video and I compare that episode to the work they took on within it. I examine the similarities and differences between them. I discuss probable reasons for those differences, if there are any. I give an opinion on whether or not the writers did a good job of translating that work of literature to the screen. Did they give the audience a good idea of what they could expect if they go on to actually read that work? Were they faithful enough to it? I look at whether or not the writers pulled out any kind of moral message from the literary work, as they often did within these episodes, to communicate to the kids at home. And finally, I talk about whether or not I found the episode entertaining. In this video, I'll be looking at an early season one episode of Wishbone that takes on Goethe's tragic play, Faust. It's an episode titled Flea Bitten Bargain. Let's take a look. What's the story, Wishbone? What's the story, Wishbone? What's this you're dreaming of? At the start of this episode, Wanda shows up to the Talbot house, panicked that the help she secured for her booth at Saturday's craft fair fell through suddenly. She wants Ellen to fill in and help her, but Ellen will be working at the library at that time, so she can't. But thankfully, Joe agrees to help instead. Relieved, Wanda starts philosophizing about how awful it would have been to be alone at the fair with no one to share in her artistic triumphs, which reminds Wishbone of the play Faust which he says is about a man who worked hard and felt lonely. In the adaptation, we see Faust, as played by Wishbone, as a learned man, a doctor and a scholar who has spent much of his life becoming those things. He's unhappy though, unsatisfied because of his loneliness. He longs for companionship and has an offhanded thought that he'd make a deal with the devil if it meant a change in his life. And wouldn't you know it, the devil himself, introducing himself as Mephisto, appears in his study. The devil has a proposition for Faust. Sign on the dotted line of the agreement and get anything his heart desires for the low, low price of the doctor's immortal soul once he has experienced true fulfillment. Faust seems reluctant to agree, but Mephisto shows him a portrait of a lovely lady on the back of the agreement. And after Mephisto promises this woman will become his girlfriend if he signs in blood, Faust changes his tune and signs. Back in Texas, Joe also gets offered a bargain. Joe, Wanda, and Wishbone are at the craft fair, but Wanda quickly gets overshadowed by the man at the neighboring booth, Dr. Montana who is hawking something called a wish o a device he promises will make all your dreams come true. Wishbone kind of steals the show, though, when the kids in the crowd start feeding him the free popcorn available on the table. Dr. Montana admires Wishbone, saying he'd like to have a doggy for his show. At the end of the craft show, though, Dr. Montana offers to let Joe try the device, which is actually a virtual reality machine, letting Joe live out his basketball dreams. But in all the excitement, Wishbone knocks over Wanda's money jar, then balls are bouncing everywhere, the place erupts in chaos. But Joe leaves desperately wanting one of those wish for himself. Faust is being shown a good time as well in the adaptation of the play. He meets up with his true love, Gretchen. Even if she is a little unnerved by the evil presence of Mephisto, but then the devil himself drags Faust away to a month-long party. When Faust brings up Gretchen at this party, his evil friend dismisses her, saying, eh, she's locked away in a dungeon. 
Faust is shocked. He demands to be taken to her and gets to see her only briefly before she dies in her cell. Faust is furious with Mephisto, saying he could have helped her if he wasn't busy partying. He demands out of his deal, but he's laughed off. There's no way out since he signed in blood. Speaking of no way out, Wishbone gets trapped inside Wanda's house when Joe goes to retrieve a new jar for the money from the fair. Joe also pulls his mom to the side during her lunch break, hinting that he wants that wish matic but deep down he knows it's not something they can afford. And once Wishbone realizes he's trapped in the house, he begins to panic. In the adaptation of the play, we have fast forwarded to when Faust is 100 years old, living with a kind old couple by the sea. Then one day, he absentmindedly yet innocently has the thought that he wishes this were his house. And then Mephisto appears, ready to do Faust's bidding, and he causes the old couple to simply disappear. Faust immediately regrets having that thought and observes that any time he likes anyone, something bad happens to them. He starts thinking that getting your own way isn't so great when someone else ends up getting hurt. When Joe gets back to the fair, Wanda is on cloud nine, having sold out of all of her artwork, every last piece sold. Now that he's not needed anymore, Joe goes back to Dr. Montana's booth and talks to him about buying a wish matic but that he doesn't know if his mom will give him the money. The salesman says Joe's mom will just have to try it out for herself. Joe goes to fetch his mom to do just that, but instead he finds her and his friends in a panic trying to find Wishbone. We, of course, know that he's still locked inside Wanda's house. And when she gets home, she's initially horrified to see the visitor in the house since she and Wishbone haven't exactly liked each other up to this point in the series. But his little face tugs on her heartstrings and the two of them share a bonding moment. But on the topic of visitors, Faust is visited by a spirit who is actually the embodiment of the feeling of care. She awakens that feeling within Faust and he rejoices, elated at those feelings of empathy. But right then, the killjoy Mephisto shows up. He's come to collect Faust's soul, since he believes the joy Faust is feeling in that moment is the kind of soul fulfillment outlined in the contract they signed. But care intervenes, saying any soul that can care for others belongs in heaven. Faust leaves with the spirit to go to his rightful resting place alongside his beloved Gretchen. Wanda brings her new buddy Wishbone back home to the Talbots when Dr. Montana, that shifty salesman, shows up on their doorstep. He makes an offer. Joe can have the Wishomatic in exchange for Wishbone. Joe is incensed. It's not just a no, it's a hell no. And Ellen asks the man to leave. Wishbone stays right where he belongs in the house and even snuggles up to Wanda. So let's talk about this episode because, wow, that was a lot. (laughs) Both storylines are far more complex than they ordinarily are in a Wishbone episode. There was barely a moment to breathe given the pace of both storylines. I've made this remark several times over the course of my coverage of this series, but the writers could get very ambitious with this show in terms of the literary works they were taking on. And I can comfortably say, now that I've seen most of the show, I think this is the single most ambitious episode in this entire series. And I am stunned that it happened so early on in the show. I really admire the courage that it took to take something like Faust and try to turn it into something digestible for kids. They had to have a lot of faith in their audience to do that. And they very consistently had faith in their audience to take on big concepts and really intimidating works of literature. But I have to say, in the case of Faust, I think they bit off a little bit more than they could chew. There are so many differences between the play and this adaptation. We would be here all day if I listed them all out. But since that's the case, we will just talk about the fundamentals. The main one being why Faust made this bargain in the first place. And in the play, which I just read a translation of, it was definitely not my impression that he made that deal with the devil because he was lonely. 
it was my impression that he felt incomplete and unfulfilled. He had done all of this learning. He had been studying and studying and studying. And yet none of that had pointed him in the direction of the true meaning of life. He felt incomplete. He felt that he had all of these unanswered questions. Then there's the whole Gretchen saga, which this episode gives you a very high level overview of. And I understand why they did that. It's because Faust behaved atrociously throughout that entire thing. You could argue he was under the influence of the devil at the time, but he was still acting of his own free will. He was making his own choices. In short, in the play, Faust gets Gretchen pregnant and then abandons her. Gretchen loses her mother, then she loses her brother in a duel with Faust, which was about the pregnancy, and then she ends up in jail because she drowned the child she gave birth to. So just know, when you see Gretchen in prison within this episode, there's a whole lot more to it than just Faust was off partying and didn't know she got locked up. That Gretchen story makes up most of the first part of the play, but then in this literary adaptation, we miss most of the second part. We just get that little snippet from Act 5 to serve as a conclusion to wrap up this storyline. And honestly, I thought that part was very decently done. I thought it made a lot of sense as the conclusion to that storyline. It's just, mm, given how loaded of a play Faust is, I can't even begin to think how they would have done this differently, how they would have done this better. I just kind of wish they wouldn't have done it at all. Like, if you can't be honest about huge chunks of this play, important parts of this play, because of time reasons or because this is a kid's show... Is it really worth doing? If you had never read or seen a performance of this play before, if you had only ever seen this adaptation, which is probably true of most of the kids watching at home, then you would understand the general premise, a man makes a deal with the devil, and you would get some scattered plot points. But I really don't think that just from watching this episode, you would have a good understanding of what this play is all about and what you could expect from reading it. And to me, that is a huge indication of the success or failure of a Wishbone episode. This episode's pacing was really frantic, too. We were bouncing back and forth between storylines way more than we normally do. I had to try to clean it up in my recap of this episode. And still, I felt like I was talking about the different storylines back and forth and back and forth. It made it really hard to feel invested in either one of the storylines. And those two storylines felt really off balance, especially because Faust gets presented with his bargain right at the start of the episode, and he accepts it. While Joe isn't even presented with his bargain until the very end of the episode. Now, I understand why the writers did that. Joe was never going to accept a bargain like that. He was never going to give up Wishbone. So they had to put it right at the end where he could reject it and show his morality by rejecting it. But then how connected are these two storylines if Joe never even accepts his bargain? What I did appreciate about this episode was that it's a 90s era tale about morality that that did not involve an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. I swear we were all bombarded with that imagery back in the day. I don't know why that was the only image they had to depict morality. So I liked that about this episode. But honestly, this episode being so all about good versus evil and man's baser instincts, the moral message wasn't even all that clear. I swear I was so busy trying to keep up with both of the storylines, I barely had time to even think about the moral message. But after some thought, I think what they were trying to go after is that love and caring for others is what ultimately saves our soul. Faust gets there eventually, and Joe, of course, was never going to trade his beloved dog for some piece of tech. Speaking of that, though, I did also really like that they included that very early version of a VR device. Just think of it. Joe Talbot got to try out what was effectively an Oculus Rift prototype. And just like kids his age these days, he loved it. I do wish they would have shown us as the audience what he was seeing in that device, or at the very least talked about what he was seeing. I just think that would have been a cool addition. Something that is really cool about this episode, though, is that it appears to be the dividing line between when Wanda hates Wishbone and then the two of them having a kind of begrudging respect for one another, I would say. 
I kept wondering when that was going to happen. Because when you watch the earliest episodes of this series, Wanda hates Wishbone. She thinks he digs up her garden. She doesn't want to be around him. But then in later episodes, they seem to be okay. So I was always kind of curious about when that transition took place. I missed a lot of these episodes back when I was a kid. Like, I don't think I ever watched this one before now. And then I've not been covering them in order here on my series. I've just been kind of bouncing all over the place. So I didn't know when that moment was going to happen. But at long last, here it is. So I liked a small handful of things about this episode, essentially. It was really cool seeing Wanda and Wishbone coming to an understanding. I applaud the writers of the show for the bravery to take on something like Foul. But unfortunately, I think this one was a swing and a miss. But those were my thoughts on this episode of Wishbone. If you have any of your own, I'd love to hear those down in the comment section below. And if you'd like to see more of these What's the Story Wishbone videos that I do, I have created a playlist that houses all the ones I've done up to this point, will contain all the ones I do in the future, which I don't have very many more left to go before I'm completely done with this series. So if you're on the hunt for one specific episode, you want to see if I've talked about it, there's every likelihood that I have already or will in the very near future. So you can check out the playlist for that. Or maybe you just want to start from the very top and watch them all. It is up to you. Either way, I will link that playlist for you in the description box below and up in the cards. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.